Hi everyone and welcome uh, and thanks for joining us for this very special live conversation about monarch butterflies. This is part of our Monarch Butterfly Week here at WWF. So wherever you're joining us from, grab a snack or a coffee or tea and relax and get ready to learn a whole lot about monarchs today. My name is Wei Wei Su and I'm with the communications team here at WWF Canada. For the next 45 minutes, we are going to be hanging out and having lots of fun with our group of experts and I'm going to drill them uh, for information on this iconic North American species. I promised I would go gentle on them, um, so let's, let's see how it goes. Um, you might be thinking, I didn't know there was a Monarch Butterfly Week. Um, the truth is we kind of made it up uh, because here at WWF we think it's really important to raise awareness um, about the threats facing the monarchs, um, things like illegal logging, lack of milkweed plants, um, and climate change. And we also think it's really important um, that we have the critical funds to work on solving those threats and conserving the monarch's wintering habitat in Mexico. So we really need your support for WWF's work in Mexico for the monarchs. And one way you can do that is through a virtual gift, which I will tell you more about later. Um, I'll just say that we have a very exciting opportunity right now um, that for a limited time, an anonymous donor in Mexico will be doubling any gift to this work, um, but more on that later. If you haven't figured it out yet, um, we really, really love monarchs here at WWF. Um, don't tell the pandas and the rhinos I said that. Um, in a second, you will get to meet some of our brilliant experts and partners from Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. Um, who are all just as nuts about monarchs. Um, I won't be the only ones asking questions today. Uh, you will get a chance to ask them questions as well. And some of you have already sent in questions, so that's great. You can do this um, in two ways. You can open the Q&A box um, on your Google Hangout page right under the video and type your questions there. Or you can email us at any time at live at www.canada.org. This is your chance to finally find out, you know, what the heck are milkweed and are they in the dairy section of the grocery store and, you know, why are the monarch's wings orange? I just made up those questions and they're terrible questions, so um, you'll come up with much better questions, I'm sure. So let me now introduce you to our monarch butterfly experts. Um, first up is Stephen Price. Um, he is our conservation expert here at WWF Canada and he's joining us from Toronto. Stephen has been with WWF Canada for 27 years and is our resident monarch guru. So Stephen, um, what was your first childhood memory of monarchs? I know you haven't always been a professional biologist, but I'm guessing you were probably spewing migratory facts about insects since you were seven. So tell, tell me about your first memory. Well, I think like a lot a lot of people, way, way, uh, monarch butterfly is one of the first um, butterflies that I came to know. And for many people, it's, it's the only one they know because it's just so beautiful and widespread and there's been a lot of attention paid to it. But that's my earliest memory. I also had later on uh, in, in my life, uh, uh, my younger life, a chance to look at uh, the pupa of the uh, monarch butterfly and see it transform into the adult. We used to hang them uh, in the cottage and, and then take them out, outside carefully to, uh, to, to let them go without damaging them. So I remember that quite vividly from many decades ago. Oh, amazing. Okay, now um, I want to introduce you to Jorge Ricards. He is joining us from Mexico City. Um, he is the conservation director at WWF Mexico and leads our monarch work there. So ho hello, Jorge, and welcome. Um, mm -hmm. Now, Jorge, you were telling me earlier um, that your family collects uh, or collected butterflies, and it was something you used to do with your father. So what was that experience like catching butterflies with your family in Mexico? Hello, sure. Well, it was it was certainly a, a life transforming experience. Actually, my great grandfather was a butterfly collector, and we have one of the oldest butterfly collections existing in Mexico since 1910. So it's been a family tradition, and I just think they're wonderful organisms that every child should be introduced to. It's a wonderful thing. Okay, fantastic. 
And uh, up next, we have Dr. Karen Oberhauser, who is joining us from Minneapolis, Minnesota. She is the head of the Monarch Joint Venture um, there and also the uh, associate professor at the University of Minnesota. Now, Karen, you've been studying monarchs since 1985, and I don't know if you know this, but you're kind of seen as a rock star in the monarch science world, so, you know, we're not worthy. Um, what is it about monarchs that fascinate you the most? Well, the first thing I studied about monarchs was their mating behavior. So they have really interesting mating behavior. Um, so that, that was the first thing that I studied. I was interested in that for about five years of research. But since then, I've branched into studying many, many different aspects of monarch butterfly biology. And I'd say that the thing that's most exciting to me now is their migratory behavior, which is mm -hmm. unparalleled in the world of insects. So it's something that's very noticeable about monarchs and just really amazing to think that an individual butterfly that weighs about as much as a paperclip can migrate all the way from Toronto or Minneapolis or Maine and get to the overwintering sites in Mexico. So that's what's most exciting to me now. Okay, great. And I hope we'll get to talk more about the migratory uh, route of the monarch later on. And um, finally, we have Laurel Miriam, who's joining us from Brighton, Ontario. She is a veteran teacher with the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board and a huge monarch champion in the classroom. And she recently joined our WWF Canada Schools for a Living Planet program for educators. Um, now, Laurel, Jorge and Stephen were just telling us about their childhood memories. And it's amazing because you are the ones who are shaping, you know, these early memories for many of your students. So do you ever look at some of these students and think they might be the next generation of monarch conservationists? That's what I'm hoping for. Um, that's what we're trying to create, are, uh, are, the, are the next generation of conservationists. And I'm trying to create a love of not only monarchs, but uh, the environment in my students. Uh, when I'm when we're teaching uh, with monarch butterflies, and I'm not the only um, teacher in my school by any means. Most of the teachers in my school work with butterflies and monarchs, and um, there are over 5,000 trained teachers through the Monarch Teacher Network that are have been trained through our program and our workshops. So that's that's the goal is to make sure these students are the ones who can carry on all the work that everyone on this panel is doing. Great, fantastic. Um, and I see you have some fun stuff behind you, so hopefully you'll tell us more about that later. Absolutely. Um, before we get to some of our more serious questions, and I, and I do have them, um, I'd like to start things off with a very competitive but friendly game of trivia uh, with our experts to see if we can you know, stump um, all of you. And I will be keeping score, so, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's okay if you get things wrong. What's that? Is there a prize? <laughs> <laughs> you will get a beautiful Monarch sticker if any of you um, get the answer right. Excellent. So let's start things off. Yeah. So, um, okay, so we'll start things off with Karen. Um, approximately how many kilometers do the Monarchs travel across North America each year from the northernmost region to Mexico? So in kilometers. Yeah. Yeah, it's approximately 3,000 kilometers. Of course, it varies a lot because they start in different places, but 3,000 is, is pretty close. Okay, fantastic. And um, Jorge, this question's for you. The monarch butterfly can't fly if their body temperature falls below what temperature? Celsius and Fahrenheit are both accepted. <laughs> approximately 10 degrees centigrade. Okay. Very good. Um, now, Laurel, true or false, the milkweed that monarchs eat actually leaves a poisonous toxin in their body. True. Okay. Very good. And Stephen, how do you tell the difference between uh, male and female monarch butterfly? Uh, the male has got little spurs, and if we go back to the image behind your, your head, uh, wait, wait, I think there's a monarch on yep. the wall with a couple of the spurs on it. <laughs> Yep. The black spurs. Yep. Okay, very good. So um, back to you, Karen. How many legs does the monarch caterpillar have? 
Um, the monarch caterpillar has, like the adult, six legs, true legs. It has yeah. what we call prolegs or false legs, and it has ten of those. Okay, um, and I just want to make a little correction to Stephen's answer uh -oh. that those aren't really called spurs, Stephen. Those are andraconial patches um, that are the spots on the male's wings. <laughs> yeah, that's what I used to call the little spurs on the back of my uh, cowboy boots. <laughs> you just called them spots, so I thought Stephen did did pretty well with spurs. Yeah, I had spots in my, on my paper here, so <laughs> very good. You get extra credit, uh, Karen. Um, Laurel, here's a question for you. Approximately how many times per minute can the monarch flap their wings? Oh my goodness, I don't know if I know that. <laughs> well, take a wild guess. Oh my gosh. Um, 50. It's a wild guess. 50. For me, that's, oh, no way, it'd be more than that. Any, any other takers? It's more than that because it's per minute. One, mm. one or two per second, so, I don't know, up to 100? Yeah, I think it would be closer to into the three or four hundreds. I mean, it really varies, but if they're flapping hard, it's it's several a second. So I bet, <laughs> you know, at least two hundred. Yeah, yeah. Karen, I think Karen's kicking butt here, guys. And uh, Jorge, during the last migratory season of 2013 to 2014, what is the area in hectares covered by monarchs in Mexico? And don't look at the poster behind me. <laughs> Because <laughs> I just realized. Oh, no, no, sure. That's it. Was uh, you said covered by monarch colonies, right? Yes, that's right. It, it was it was point sixty seven hectares, which okay. was pretty a pretty low number compared to prior years. That's right. And Stephen, last question for you: How many generations do the monarch population cycle through in its annual migration? Well, it 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 could depend, but the uh, the northbound. Uh, uh, monarchs who are flying north right now, the adults, it may be three or four generations before they arrive uh, into central uh, Canada, as far north as they go. Okay, very good. So I, I have to say, Karen, I think, won that round uh, pretty, uh, pretty good. She did pretty good. <laughs> okay, so um, this question is for Stephen, and 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 you know we're we're getting into sort of the more serious questions now. But um, I'm sure all of you guys know the drop in monarch population in Me Mexico has been quite dramatic and alarming. And WWF recently released a report in January showing that the number of monarchs hibernating in Mexico have reached an all-time low in 2013. So, Stephen, can you give us the big picture of what's happening? Um, how how serious this, is this and what's causing the decline? And then after that, I'm going to ask Jorge to talk about what WWF and our partners are doing to address this. Right. So, um, thank you, Weiwei. And uh, the monarchs have been in long-term decline. Their numbers can go up and down from year to year, but uh, when we look at the long-term trend, they're definitely declining. It's quite worrisome as to whether this uh, migratory phenomenon, as we call it, this migration, is going to survive. Um, and as often it is the case with species that are in decline, there'll be two or three or four factors coming together at once, which can make it very difficult for the species to withstand or to rebound uh, from all those uh, effects. For sure, for a long time, we were quite worried about the state of the forests in, in Mexico. One expert talks about how the forests are like a blanket that keep them at just the right temperature, sort of refrigerator temperature, uh, and that if there are holes in the blanket from uh, roads being cut or from illegal logging, then uh, then that can lead to changes in temperature and disruption of the colonies. So Jorge will mention more about that because a lot's been done to address that, but that was a long-standing threat. Combined with that, we now know in, in Canada and the United States where common milkweed was widespread, we're losing lots of habitat in which milkweed plants uh, used to uh, thrive in the thousands and thousands and particularly in farming areas, uh, cornfields and soya, and uh, Karen can speak more to that one in a few minutes, but that affects the monarchs where they're breeding in the northern parts of their range. And then thirdly, and maybe the, the, the least difficult to appreciate, but, but one that's becoming more and more uh, evident is climate change, and this is true for many other species, but for the monarchs too, because of climate change, we're seeing uh, more storms, uh, more intense 
longer duration with greater impacts. We're also seeing both more extreme hot temperatures and dry weather in the in the summering grounds, but uh, also sometimes very cool and wet in the spring. And the monarchs and other insects are so dependent on temperature and humidity that uh, a great change in, in the envelope, we call it, of, of temperature and humidity in which they have to live could really uh, impact them. So you, you mix all of these together, plus other threats like mm -hmm. um, uh, stray pesticides and herbicides, then uh, you, the monarchs are, migration is really under threat. So that's our long-term concern, and these threats have been increasing as that long-term decline uh, in the number of monarchs has been counted in Mexico. Okay, thank you, Stephen. So then let's go to Jorge. Um, and uh, Jorge, your team is on the ground working with the government and local partners to help protect the, the monarchs and the monarch reserves. So tell us about this conservation program and what you've been able to achieve. And I know that in terms of illegal logging, uh, one of the main threats to monarchs, uh, you saw a big win in recent years in the, effect in the, in the effectiveness of cutting down illegal logging. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, uh, WWF has been uh, involved in monarch conservation for many years. At, as, as far as I can remember, at least 20 or 23 here in, in Mexico. Uh, initially working with local organizations that were trying to conserve the, the area. Then uh, WWF was very involved in the creation of the reserve. Uh, and, and we've been getting more involved every year in direct conservation in the area. Uh, as you said, we have a team there of uh, scientists and, and, and uh, in the field conservationists working with local communities to uh, uh, fight the threats that are, that are uh, threatening the butterfly, butterfly colonies. And most of the work has been uh, focused on working with the people, with the local people that own the forests in terms of trying to find ways, first of all, to halt illegal logging. But in order to do that, we have to find alternative sources of uh, livelihoods, of income. So uh, we're talking of indigenous communities. We are talking of what we call here in Mexico, ejidos. And the way we are doing that is uh, creating uh, compensation, economic compensation mechanisms, like, for example, the Monarch Butterfly Conservation Fund. But we're also uh, injecting energy into local businesses like, for example, handicrafts, where we have uh, women working on that, and also restoration through the, the, uh, the creation of nurseries. We have 10 nurseries that generate several thousands of little trees every year that are then planted by the communities. Actually, I, I have a little example here of some of the things that are done in, in the local uh, handicrafts by the local women. This is a little butterfly that's made out of wood and then hand-painted. Oh. It's really nice. And uh, you know, it has magnets in the back, so you can stick it in your in your uh, fridge or, or anything like that. Uh, yeah. The good thing, the good news, is that we saw uh, a large decrease in illegal logging in the last number of years. Uh, several years ago, we had um, several hundreds of hectares in the in the area being logged. I'm talking massive logging. Uh, about a couple of years ago, we could say we virtually eliminated massive illegal logging. We saw last year a little bit of an increase. We are talking about uh, eight, eight uh, areas that were affected, but mm -hmm. of that, only five actually account for illegal logging. The rest was actually a wind, strong wind, and, and fires. Mm -hmm. so, so we can talk about a good trend in conservation of the forest in the area, but the challenges that Steve mentioned are still there. We're mm -hmm. talking about climate change. We're talking about livelihoods for local people. Yeah. Okay. Well, congratulations on that on that success. And you know, of course, there's so much more to be done. Um, I I would like to get to one of our audience questions. Um, I will be uh, bringing in audience questions throughout the the hangout. And um, the first one is actually from a student. His name is James from Laurel's class. Um, who would like to know: Are there different kinds of monarchs? Um, so uh, maybe Karen, if you want to take a stab at that question first. Sure, so if we're just talking about monarchs, it is one species. Um, the scientific name is Danaeus plexippus, so there is only one kind of, of actual monarch butterfly, but there are many closely related species um, that have different names, but there is only one kind of monarch. Okay, great. 
Um, so, Karen, I, I wa I'd like to continue with you. So, um, another threat to the, the monarch is the lack of milkweed plants in the U.S. and Canada. Can you talk a little bit about this plant and why it's so critical to the survival of the monarchs? And you know, should we all be planting milkweed in our backyards this, this spring? Sure. So, milkweed is the only um, kind of plant that monarch caterpillars can eat. Now, unlike there only being one kind of monarch, there are many kinds of milkweed. So there are milkweed plants that grow in Mexico, different species that grow in the southern U.S. Um, so there are actually dozens and dozens of kind, different kinds of milkweed, different species of milkweed that grow in the, in the United States, Mexico, and Canada. And mm -hmm. monarchs can eat most of them. So um, monarchs completely depend on milkweed. and. Yeah. We know that um, milkweed is being lost from, from habitat. So I'm going to tell a little bit of a personal story here. Being a scientist involves hard work, but sometimes it involves just luck, doing the right thing at the right time. Mm -hmm. And in 2000, I work, the year 2000, I worked with several other scientists in, in North America to study how much milkweed was in corn and soybean fields. Um, mm -hmm. And did monarchs use the milkweed that was in these corn and soybean fields? And what we found is that there used to be a lot of milkweed in corn and soybean fields, and monarchs were using this milkweed. Um, and what's happened is this milkweed is gone. Because of the use of genetically modified crops, farmers can now spray herbicides on their fields, and, and this milkweed has pretty much all disappeared. So, and, and we're losing other milkweed to other things, um, roadside mowing, um, the edges of fields, some land that used to have milkweed and it is being used to build houses or, or other things. So what that means, in, in answer to your second question, is that it's very important that we work to replace all of this milkweed that was lost, or at least as much of the milkweed that was lost as possible. Mm -hmm. So something that people in the United States and Canada can do that will really help monarchs is to increase the amount of habitat that's available for them and that means increasing the amount of milkweed and nectar plants that they can use in in broad areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you Karen. And I have another question from the audience and um, Stephen I wonder if you can answer this one. Um, how do the monarchs fly so long and, and so far with wings that are so light and delicate? And this is from a kindergarten student. Wow, how do they fly so far and so long? Yes. Well, they're, they're fueled by nectar that they, they drink from uh, plants. Um, but I might punt that one over to Karen and see if she has anything more she'd like to add. So Stephen is right. They're fueled by nectar that they, they take nectar in, which is a very sugary solution, and they change that just like if you guys listening to this eat a lot of um, things with a lot of sugar, you get fat. Well, that happens to monarchs too. They get fat and they can use that fat to fuel their long flights. But another really amazing thing about monarchs is that when they're flapping their wings, I don't know if you can see me flapping my wings now, but when they're flapping their wings, they're using a lot of energy. But during this 3,000 kilometer flight, they actually spend a lot of time not flapping their wings, so they soar. So if you've ever watched a bird fly, um, some species of birds flap their wings a lot and other species do a lot of soaring where they're not flapping their wings but they're taking advantage of the air currents. Mm -hmm. So monarchs do that a lot while they're migrating. So they conserve energy as much as they can by just soaring as they're flying to Mexico. Okay, thank you. So that's a great question from a kindergarten student. And, um, and speaking of students, um, I want to talk a bit about our uh, WWF Schools for a Living Planet program where we work with teachers um, like Laurel and we provide them with great tools and resources to help bring conservation into the classroom and sometimes outside the classroom. 
And we saw an overwhelming response in March from teachers across Canada when we shared our butterfly curriculum and an offer of milkweed seeds. And we ended up getting requests and sending seeds to over 1,000 teachers in 700 schools across Canada. And Laurel was one of the teachers we connected with through this effort. And she has brought science and nature into her classroom in very creative and hands-on ways. And Laurel, I, I mean, you know, I, I'd like you to talk, talk a little bit about what's behind you, but also um, talk a little bit about the excitement that you've seen from students over the years, uh, you know, when you do things with them like the, the Monarch Garden and starting, you know, milkweed plants in your classroom. Okay. Um, well, behind me, just so you, uh, just so you know, um, the light is coming from um, actually a grow table that uh, I lucked out and found at a yard sale uh, last summer. So I have three shelves of milkweed that I started um, a month or so ago with my students. And there's several different species of milkweed growing on the table. Um, so it's it's doing well, except for the common. Common doesn't as common as it is, it doesn't like to grow, especially in pots. But anyway, it's fine. <laughs> so mm. that's what's going on there. Um, and uh, also, um, it's not looking great yet because it, it's too early here in Canada. But um, we have a, a monarch way station that I planted with my students last year um, out in the just outside my classroom. And um, so it, it's a certified way station through Monarch Watch. It has uh, everything it needs. It has two species of milkweed in it. Actually, I think it has three. Um, and uh, all the nectar plants as well that it requires. So um, we had a great time doing all of that mm -hmm. in that garden. And we have to work with it because it does have some annual plants in it. So we have to replace those. Um, so that's something that you know, any school can do uh, is to create a butterfly garden, even if you have just, our, our garden is not big. Um, I didn't, I don't have a lot of time to maintain a garden, so um, it really is not a big space. So um, any school can do that. Uh, mm -hmm. and you can look for funding and that kind of thing. Yep. Um, if you need yep. help with that. Yep. Master gardeners, uh, if you have a horticultural society, can support you with that as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. And what's the reaction that you've seen from your students when you do this with them? Are they excited? Are they, you know, fascinated? Are they like getting their hands dirty and planting things with you? And most kids love to get their hands dirty. Some kids, it's, I I work with students with special needs, so some of them know they don't want to get their hands dirty, but there's always something they can do. They all love to dig with a shovel. They all, you know, going. Actually, I was able to take my students to the nursery to pick out the plants, so they all love that. Mm -hmm. but of course they get excited and the fact that they're outside rather than in the classroom that part of it is always exciting yes yeah. let's go outside and let's you know pick the rocks out of the dirt and get rid of those and you know they love it they love to be to be outside and but we weave it through the whole curriculum as well mm -hmm. so it's not it's not just um, you know that part of things it's we weave it into our language curriculum, into our science curriculum, into our social studies curriculum, into our math wow. curriculum. It gets mm -hmm. woven through. I don't do anything except monarchs for probably the first six weeks of school. When the last wow. person I leaves, usually mid-October, by the time they're all finished doing their thing, and we say goodbye um, in mid-October, that's kind of when I when I tie things up and we move on to oh, there are other things in the world besides monarchs? Okay, well, I wasn't sure, but <laughs> maybe that's when we, we kind of move on to other things. But that first six weeks is really focused on monarchs and the environment and, and what are we doing to make the world a better place. Okay. Um, and then this time of year with Earth Day, you know, it starts to, to kind of crop, crop up again and, and what are we doing? And, and, of course, our butterflies come back uh, from uh, our Journey North butterflies uh, arrived today, actually. Okay. Very exciting. So... Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I have another question from the audience, and um, this is from a grade three student in Milk River, Alberta. Um, Jorge, I wonder if you could take this one. How do monarch butterflies get their beautiful colors? Well, I, uh, one reason for that is basically genetic, and, and uh, it's simply an inherited trait. Uh, I would imagine, and, and, and here I, I, I would not be able to answer with, with absolute certainty that also part of their diet has to do with that, 
but yeah. um, it, uh, but also the collar itself is a warning because it is a toxic butterfly. So as you know, as as Karen mentioned, the the reason they feed on milkweed is 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 because they are actually assimilating the toxins in milkweed, so that deters predators. So as as in many other insects or animals in nature, orange, red, yellow are warning colors. Uh, but maybe Karen could answer that in terms of how exactly they get the color. Now, uh, in all butterflies, as you know, the wings are covered by very small scales, and mm -hmm. those scales are the ones that are actually reflecting light. The composition of the scales and the structure of those, those scales sometimes create iridescent effects, like some metallic effects. So I would imagine, or I would guess, that also the structure and composition of those scales in the wings are also partly, partly responsible for that color, uh, together, as I said, with the genetic trait itself. Great. And Karen, did you want to add anything to that? No, Jorge did a great job on that question. But Very he's been good. studying butterflies since he was a little kid, that's why. That's true. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you guys are, are fantastic, and thank you for your work on monarchs. And I want to make sure that we do have enough time left over to get to more questions from our audience, and I've got a bunch here. Um, but I, I, I do want to say that this conversation today is really highlighted for me, and I hope for folks watching, that um, the decline of the monarchs is very serious and that so much great work is happening right now to conserve the species and their habitat. And, you know, WWF is there on the ground in Mexico, and we re really need uh, your support for this vital work. And one way you can do this today is by making a virtual gift of $50 to help protect the flight of the monarchs. And I'm going to, in a second, ask my colleague Steph here to put up the link, um, wwf.ca slash support monarchs. Um, but I, I'll mention again that we currently have an anonymous donor that has agreed to match any gift to WWF's monarch work in Mexico. So any donation you make today will be doubled. And Jorge, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about why it's so critical that this work in Mexico continues to be funded. Of course. Well, um, monarchs are part of, of uh, local culture. In, especially in the area where they hibernate in Michoacán and in the state of Mexico. But even though local people uh, respect butterflies and, and have a strong linked, link culturally with them, they, we are talking about poor communities, poor indigenous communities that are fighting to make a living, that uh, have traditionally lived from the forests, but now are facing you know, progress, development, and many elements that move them to put pressure on the forest. So as, as long as we can help these communities develop livelihoods, sustainable businesses like better tourism uh, alternatives, like handicrafts, like uh, better water management, etc., they will be able to exert less pressure on the forest. So that's just a basic direct uh, element. Uh, mm -hmm. The other is environmental education activities that, that are done with children uh, in the reserve, but not only in the reserve. We work very strongly also with schools, for example, here in Mexico City. Actually today, the, the last three days, we have been giving talks in several schools. The, this uh, butterfly that, that is behind me, I hope that, that it can be seen, is one of the elements that we are using. And, and we print, for example, these other uh, uh, elements like booklets, like, like this one that we give to the children, uh, that you can open and learn about the biology, the importance of the butterflies, where they are, why, why maintaining a biosphere reserve is so important. Uh, and as I said earlier, and, and, you, and, and you asked about why butterflies are so important, and specifically monarchs, it's because they create this link with, with our, our uh, I would say, our natural love to nature. I think we all grow and are born with an intrinsic love towards nature, that mm. because of the way of life we have, we tend to lose. And I think that butterflies, like monarchs, are wonderful ambassadors. So as long as we can keep working to send the message that nature is important, that we depend on nature, 
that butterflies like monarchs are symbols of that dependence. And, and as I said earlier, it's not only the practical aspect, I'm sorry, the, the emotional aspect, but it's, different, it's also the practical aspect. Uh, for example, the monarch hybrid hibernating areas in the state of Mexico and Michoacán are part of the system that supplies water to Mexico City. So the forests mm -hmm. in that region are extremely vital for all of us that live in, in Mexico City. So conserving butterflies are, is also a way, or the monarch butterfly and the reserve is also a way to generate sources of uh, water for people living in Mexico City. So it helps us also establish the link between nature, between our own livelihood. And that is an example that we can show to the rest of the world because no matter what city or town we live in, we are all connected to nature. So, so that support helps us, as I said, help, help and work with local communities, support the government, uh, establish brigades, that actually go out to the forest to uh, make sure there is no illegal logging, to warn about any kind of threat like a forest fire so it can be immediately suppressed, mm -hmm. uh, fight uh, local plagues that sometimes affect the forest, but also, as I said earlier, generate alternative livelihoods for the people uh, mm -hmm. through the nurseries, through mushroom production, uh, integrated water manage management and other elements like that. Yeah, thank you, Hor. I, I really like what you said about, you know, at the end of the day, we are all connected to nature. So at some point, it does all in, it does impact us all. And um, we've just uh, we're about to share the link to the virtual gift, um, which is again www.ca/supportmonarchs in the chat box. Or if you're watching um, live at uh, www.ca/live, you can. Click on the Donate Now button on the right side of the page. So, you know, again, if you are as nuts about monarchs as we all are and want to help rebuild their crucial wintering habitat in Mexico, please do make a gift now and um, do it today so that your gift can be doubled. And, um, and thank you again for your support. And we do have uh, a little bit of time left to answer more questions from the audience. And um, uh, I don't know if you guys will recognize this name, Don Davis. I feel like Stephen, you talked about him. He is watching, and he has a question. And so maybe Stephen, you can take this one. How can those rearing one um, to many monarchs at home or school prevent the spread of the parasite OE? Um, Stephen, if you can explain a bit, and if we need to call on Karen for backup, we'll we'll do that. Well, we we all know Don Davis, and uh, it, it's great that he's uh, sent, is watching and could join us as a uh, as an expert himself, uh, even though he calls himself only an assistant scientist. But I'll I'll toss that one to Karen because it it does concern the uh, rearing and the disease, and she'll be better able to handle it. Sure. So OE is a parasite that we've studied a lot in our lab, and it stands for Ophryocystis electroscura which is a, a parasite, it's a disease, just like people get diseases, monarchs do too. And this is a particularly insidious disease because it's easily transferred from female monarchs when they're laying eggs to their offspring. So um, actually Laurel and I were chatting about this before we started and, and she is a real expert in this. It, it takes being really careful about your rearing conditions, um, making sure that Caterpillars are never in the same cage with adult butterflies because the adult butterflies have the spores of this disease on the outside of their bodies. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that you clean your cages regularly, sterilize them. And um, there's a great citizen science project that's run out of the University of Georgia in the United States called Project Monarch Health. And they have a website, I think it's called monarchparasites.org. But you can actually, they can help you sample the butterflies that you raise for this disease so you know if you have the disease or not. So I'd like to put in a plug for that project and also all citizen science projects. I just loved what Jorge said about the way that monarchs make connections between people and, and nature and help us realize that we are all connected. And what's mm. so exciting about monarchs is that anybody can help study them through citizen science projects like Project Monarch Health or Journey North, which Laurel also talked about um, 
There's the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. There are just so many different citizen science projects. And I would encourage anyone listening to get involved. And, and Don Davis is probably the most experienced monarch citizen scientist out there. So he mm -hmm. knows all about that. Fantastic. Can I jump in for one second there? Of course, of course. That's one of the things that we can do as teachers um, to help keep our kids excited is to involve them in those citizen science projects um, mm. because when you're telling kids you're involved in a real life science project, this is something scientists are doing particularly and I'm going to say right now, hi Don, it's wonderful that you're watching. Um, and this is something that Don is truly, he's a world record holder, uh, is tagging. So that's something that I do with my students every year is we tag our monarchs before we send them off in the fall. And I tell my kids, you're participating in real life science. How exciting is that, that somebody who's 8 or 9 or 10 years old gets to be part of a scientific project that somebody's doing somewhere in the world? That's mm -hmm. exciting. And they love it. They think it's the coolest thing in the world. So thank you for making that connection, Karen, that... Um, you know that that's anybody can take part in that, and it's it really is exciting. And then when you have a recovery, like wow, <laughs> how great is that? Right. right? We haven't yeah, had that happen yet, but Don will let me know if it happens. So, <laughs> cool. I, I wonder, Stephen, if you can tell the story of how the the Citizen Science Project around tagging monarchs started originally with the Orcarts. You were telling me about this earlier. It was a fascinating story. Sure. Well. Karen and Laurel and, and Don are all participating in uh, different kinds of uh, tagging projects in different parts of North America, but all of this goes back to some early scientific work done by two Canadians, uh, Fred and Nora Urquhart. Don Davis, the, uh, the, the last questioner, uh, worked very closely with them and uh, most of us have, have met them. Uh, and uh, I had the privilege once of meeting them right in their house on the uh, campus of Scarborough College at the University of Toronto and they showed me uh, their early photographs of what they did but they struggled for years with how could they tag a monarch butterfly and they tried all different kinds of devices but eventually came up with tiny pieces of paper with a little bit of glue uh, and they put the uh, tag onto the wing of the butterfly and they tested it to make sure it wasn't having some serious impact on the butterfly and t tags since then have, have, have improved and they've become smaller and lighter and, and, and easier to, to affix or to put on the wings but imagine that they were just gluing essentially a piece of paper with an address on it to mail the, uh, uh, the wing if the dead butterfly were found and the tag were found back to them at the University of Toronto and I saw on the wall there, they had a map of North America and they had a little pin wherever the butterfly was found and they matched it up based on the number of the tag with the, uh, another pin up to where it was tagged uh, in southern Ontario or in the prairies in Canada and the U.S., wherever it was. And all these lines, of course, pointed down towards Mexico. And that was a time when biologists and naturalists and butterfly lovers knew that monarch butterflies left in the fall. They left Canada and the U.S., but we didn't know where they went. And eventually, and this is a relatively modern discovery, but in the 1970s, a lot of people started looking in central Mexico and actually found these um, golden forests, if you will. The local people knew that the modern but monarch butterflies arrived, but they also didn't know exactly where they came from. So this is a fantastic modern scientific discovery that came as a result of enthusiasts simply tagging butterflies, making a map of the of, of where they were tagged and where they went, and that led to this um, exciting knowledge we have now that a, a migratory insect spans all of North America uh, and takes several generations to do so in its in its life cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that that's a great great story, and we have time for just one more question. So Jorge, I wonder if you can answer this one. Um, Charlotte from Barrie, Ontario wants to know, where do the monarchs spend the most amount of time throughout the year? Well, if, if we are talking about the population that migrates to Mexico, it would be uh, through the migration mostly in the United States and Canada because it only arrives here and stays through the winter in Mexico. Uh, it's a more or less three month uh, period of time 
they start migrating approximately around September, uh, going south in, from Canada and getting to Mexico approximately in November. Actually, the local communities relate the butterflies with the spirits of the dead because the 1st of November here in Mexico is the Day of the Dead where we revere mm -hmm. our ancestors. So it's very, very symbolic. Um, so it takes approximately three months and then three months back and more or less three or four months here, which is the winter, as, as the overwinter in Mexico. So adding up all those months, it's basically the migration and the time they spend in Canada, uh, probably the longest uh, time in, in their lifespan. But, but I'm here I'm talking about several generations too, because it's, uh, it's several generations that migrate back, that, that actually reproduce, that breed and, until they get Canada once, uh, to Canada once again, and then there is the Methuselah generation that, because of the climatic conditions and the temperature, flies back directly to Mexico. So the whole process is, is what I'm talking about. Uh, the Methuselah generation would last approximately yeah, uh, two or three months. And please, mm -hmm. colleagues, do jump in here if, if I'm not correct, but I, that's what I'm more or less my, I can estimate. Um, uh, as it goes as it goes back. So so more or less that's the way I would describe it. Okay, thank you. Well, um, we we have run out of time, so this is the, the end of our uh, hangout together. And I want to thank Jorge and Karen and Stephen and Laurel so much. You guys are, are fantastic. And thank you so much for doing the work that you do, and it, it is very important. And to our audience, a big thanks um, for uh, you know joining us today and for making a contribution. And uh, don't forget that your gift to WWF's Mexico work will be matched. And stay in touch with us. You can check out the WWF website at WWF.ca for more great stories and activities for Monarch Butterfly Week and other ways to get involved with us. And from all of us here at WWF, thank you for hanging out with us today. And I hope you'll join us um, for our next Google Hangout, which will be in June. And details for that will come soon, so stay tuned. And thanks so much for watching.